Um, tonight, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about learning targets and how important that is as we start any learning journey. Uh, several words that are underlined on the screen tonight, dynamic learning leadership. That is very, very important, that word dynamic. Learning leadership is different than management. Different dynamic learning leadership means very engaged and thoughtful, collaborative um, leadership. And so tonight, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody who's managing a school or managing a learning community. We're talking about a dynamic uh, situation where people are deeply engaged in the human experience. The other words that are underlined are humanizing. Uh, we want to make sure that we personalize and humanize, humanize and touch the hearts of our learning community and our students, and we weave it into the fabric of everyone, the learning momentum, that forward lean. And you'll probably understand that these words are underlined for a very, very important reason. Research shows us right now learning momentum has stalled. And especially when we look at the word for all, we have tremendous gaps in our country and we have growing gaps because of the COVID crisis. So tonight we want to make sure we're talking about momentum in learning, dynamic leadership, and the reason uh, specifically for all, for all learners. So we develop those learning communities. Tonight's going to be an informative and reflective. Uh, hopefully you're going to uh, understand a lot of the content that I, threw, that I talk about tonight. But I want you to reflect on your personal experience. That is what's critical about this. Uh, a large school, a small school, a public school, a charter school, um, a, a, a private school is going to be very, very different. A school of 144 students compared to a school of 3,000 students. Um, I was talking to an aspiring principal the other day, and they were talking about learning momentum for all. And she said, I want to actionize that statement. What I'm going to do as an intern is I'm going to engage my principal, and we're going to knock on the doors of 132 houses to make sure that I am engaged with the learning momentum for all. That gave me chills, but, I, uh, but at the same time, that's what dynamic learning is. And so we look at uh, the informative content, reflect on your situation, and how you will actionize that and bring it to life. We want to talk about the journey of teacher leaders. I can't say the word teacher without saying the word leader because we are all leaders, positive and negative, in our own ways. Teacher leaders, they provide momentum. Aspiring principals, veteran learning organizational leaders, we want to make sure that we all are deeply engaged to not only academically and organizationally survive, and I want to underline this over and over, but thrive while enhancing student outcomes. Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, several different schools as some case studies, and we're going to talk about Barry University universities and some unique things that Barry University has done to actionize learning and to make sure that we bring our core commitments, our common commitments to life. And so as we look at our learning targets today, those words, dynamic learning leadership, humanizing learning momentum for all, informative but reflective, reflective on your experience is critically important. Learning organizational leaders, and we want to thrive while enhancing student outcomes. But before we do that, I think there's something we also really need to do. We need to acknowledge what we're dealing with. Uh, and it is a very, very, very serious um, process of the realities of COVID. Uh, we have death. We have 180,000 individuals in our country that has pa passed recently because of COVID-19. And I never want to take that lightly. And I want to make sure that I reach out and, uh, uh, and uh, say a heartfelt um, 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 gratitude for you being here and also for all those folks who have experienced either personally um, um, or have come in contact in some way with the passing because of COVID. As we look at the chronic illness and emotional distress that is caused by that, as we look at the trauma, isolationism, the, uh, I have an uncle who is passing at this moment, and he is isolated in his death. And one of the hardest things in his life has been is that isolation. And of course, as we get to the end of that road, not to have those pe people that we love connected to us. So our emotional health as a, uh, as a learning community, as educators, and as a country. Our financial crisis that has changed the lives of many, many, many folks and also has created some of the, uh, the incredible uh, emotional distress because of not knowing, will my job be there? We need to be very, very sensitive to those things. And we need to be sensitive to the children as they return to school. And also, we got to put the word in there, politics, positive and negative. Politics have played an amazing role, uh, negative and positive, as we look at it. We are very often not talking about uh, COVID-19 as a health crisis, but as a political issue, and that's wrong in our society. And we need to make sure that we put that concept 
on the table. So again, I want to uh, reach out to everyone and say that we feel the pain of COVID-19, that we need to work together as a country, we need to work together as a community and educators to make sure that we acknowledge the realities, but we don't get stunned into uh, motionless uh, because of those realities. We need to look at this with hope, and we need to look at this with energy and passion, because we need to do that together to move forward. Leadership action or inaction. One of the things that has concerned me from the day that uh, uh, in, in, in March, there, where all of a sudden the school came to a close. Most people said within 14 days we'll be back in action. There was a lot of inaction during that time because everyone thought this is the time we're, we're going to allow uh, us, uh, the world to heal and we will come back in 14 days. I was very impressed with the president of Barry University, Dr. Allen, who said be prepared to go for the duration. Um, we, want, we would like to be optimistic and come back in 14 days, but be prepared. Do what you need to do to be successful with your students and the learning. And that paid great dividends at Barry University. And for folks who really look past that, is it was a very, very important phenomenon. So we really want to look at tonight, we want to look at who owns the learning. And if we argue about who's owning the learning, someone isn't owning the learning. The individual, the classroom, the learning community, and organizationally, we know that kids, have, kids and students have a responsibility. We know that parents have a responsibility. We know that teachers and administrators have a responsibility. But we all need to reach out together and hold hands tightly to collaboratively own the learning. If we don't, we drop the ball of, of inaction. How will we respond? Who will be responsible for what? In our learning communities, we need to have, have powerful conversations about who's owning the learning and making sure we bring that concept to life. What will be the learning and the learning community outcomes? We know that something will happen, be it that we deeply engage or we don't engage. We will very, very will be in a better place because of design or we will drift because of default. And so as we look at what will be the learning and the learning community outcome, something is going to happen. It's a simple mathematical problem. We know what happened in March because of inaction. We know what happened in the spring. Uh, we had silos of greatness, but we also had challenges where we have bigger gaps today. We had a summer where we reduced learning. Uh, uh, we have a learning drift in a normal situation. Now we have a fall where we have those challenges along the way. What will we continue to do to support learning and growth within our communities? We also want to look at what our why is and your why is and how our organizational why and passion and purpose align. How will we focus and what will drive us? And the last question I want to ask you about leadership, and again, on our reflective journey today, today who is your chief visionary? And that's a question a lot of people tilt their heads on. Who is the visionary in your classroom, in your learning community, in your school, uh, across the country that will lead us in a direction so we will come out of this COVID-19 crisis in a better place? Because we can't continue to drift. We can't continue to have inaction. And if you don't have a chief visionary in your life, you need to become that person. As we look at the next words, purposely conserve traditions. There are things that are very important in our educational organizations, in our learning, in our communities, in our country. And we need to purposely conserve traditions. But we also need to really measure what does that mean. Or do we want to conserve traditions or continue systematic issues, systemic challenges that we've had in our country forever that we need to grow behind. Sometimes we hold on to traditions for tradition's sake, and so we need to look at systemic issues that we need want to eliminate, and if we hang on to traditions, how we would perpetuate that. We need to re-image. What will be the image of our schools in the future? Should they be the same? If they aren't the same and we re-image re them, we need to re-engineer. What does that mean? That means we need to actionize, we need to plan, we need to change. And so as we look at leadership in action, we can't have inaction. Our kids are too important. Our country and communities are too important. So as we look at leadership action, we need to be cautious of our inaction. Tonight, we're not going to do a formal SWOT analysis, and most people know and understand what a SWOT analysis is. I tr tr uh, sincerely believe in the 51% responsibility rule. I would rather live in a world where two people take 51%, people take responsibility for action, and our biggest challenge in the world is, tr is, is tripping all over people who want greatness, that want good things to happen, that want to support people. So I want to make sure that we're looking at that 51% responsibility rule instead of saying it is not my responsibility because it is. If you are 
you're a teacher in the classroom, if you're a superintendent, if you are a state representative, governor, or president, we need to be responsible for what's happening in our countries, in our communities, and in our classrooms. So as we look at a SWOT analysis, I, I uh, invite you to think about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in your school, in your classroom, in your learning community. Because as we start to evaluate that, we can leverage those items. We can eliminate those items, or we can leverage those items to continue to uh, build our communities. Well, also tonight, I want to make sure that you're taking a look at uh, force field analysis. Because if you look at the arrows in the middle, we can, we, can we can develop our reality. It says proposed change. We have forces for change and we have forces resisting change and those things are always gonna happen by default or we can engage by design. As we look at our, 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 our SWOT analysis and bring those items forward and have a design for forces of change and leadership change or eliminating things that uh, don't allow us to change. The bottom line is those arrows will come together Something will happen at the end of September. Something will happen in October, just like it did in March and through the summer. In just a few moments, we'll, we'll look at the statistics of learning, and it's not pretty. Uh, there are tremendous losses of learning, and there are tremendous gaps that are growing even more, mainly because of inaction, not having a long-term plan, a systematic process that allowed us to achieve. We'll come back to both of those screens in just a moment. The other one that has been a challenge for us is the political process. Who is right? We have the World Health Organization that comes out one day that says don't wear masks. We have, an, we have another organization that comes out that says to wear masks. We see pictures of, uh, you probably saw that picture in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, of schools in Georgia, large high schools that don't believe in social, social distancing or masks. We have a governor who that says all schools will open. We have a president that says all schools will open. Um, we have a judge that says um, ruled in favor of the Florida teachers that says that schools should not open and this is a health issue, this isn't a political issue. And so as we continue to argue amongst ourselves as educators and leaders about who is right, who is wrong, we have learning loss. We have community loss and we have opportunity loss. We need to make sure, look at how we move beyond some of those issues and look at learning and put together comprehensive plans to grow. So we have the struggle. We have po politics and science. It reminds me of a story, uh, uh, the movie of the Challenger, uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger and the O-Rings. The O-Rings, uh, there was a political process that said we need to build the Space Shuttle in different areas because of some political connections. There were scientists and engineers that says because of this O-Ring, when you put this engine together, it will not last. We didn't listen to the scientists, we didn't listen to the engineers, and we had a result. As we look at science and we look at politics, we need to be very, very cautious about listening to scientists and medical experts and treating this as a health issue, not a political issue. And we need to be very, very cautious as a community. Yes, we all have political feelings, and those emotions often get in our way. At the same time, I want to be reminded of the space shuttle O-ring and the political issues where scientists said this will happen. We didn't listen, and there was a result. We need to be, use that as a cautionary measure. We need to look at safety and logistical leadership. As I talk to principals across the, uh, the South, uh, South Florida and across the upper Midwest where I'm very well connected, we have principals that are spending the majority of their time talking about safety, which they should. Health and wellness of our kids, our community are very important, but spending uh, a large portion of their time talking about safety and logistical leadership versus learning, personal growth, and development, areas that we need to be involved in. And so we can't allow safety and logistics to get in the way of learning and personal growth and development. Doesn't mean we, we, we need to discard it. We need to make sure the logistics are in place so our kids can come back and be, be healthy and well. At the same time, we need to be very, very cautious about the amount of time we're putting into safety and logistics compared to learning, personal growth, and development. One leadership tip may be that, that uh, chief visionary or that person that you name within your organization to really focus on safety and logistics, someone else to focus on learning and personal growth, because otherwise we will continue to be pulled down towards the safety and logistics because that is critically important. Another research aspect, we talk about crockpot instruction. When we started in March, many people believed that we would be back in 14 days. Thus, we loaded the crockpot, the online, the learning management processes with information. We instructed children and uh, parents how to, how to access that information, how to access that crock pot and eat, and how to engage in that learning. Unfortunately, in a lot of learning organizations, they didn't grow past the crock pot instruction. It was very impersonal. And that chart started to change the, the fo focus 
of when people started to return. Because most people said, if I'm coming back to crockpot instruction, I'm going to look at a different area of education. We had tremendous shifts in education from, from large public schools to smaller magnet schools and private schools, and nothing wrong with that. People have a chance to do that. But by default, we lost students because we didn't take advantage of that learning and planning process, as opposed to engaged, authentic learning. How do we, in the age of COVID-19, engage deeply in the authentic learning process? And those are some of the things that we will talk about tonight. I'm going to take you on a 60-second tour of the United States and the world around us. And one of the reasons I like to do this from a qualitative standpoint, when you look at these visual images from around the world, it will tell a very important story about education. And it's not the education that I care to be a part of, although it is a reality. It's a reality of where we temporarily were. It isn't where we should be. It isn't where we need to go. It is a reality. We need to change that reality. And as leaders, how will we do that in our learning communities? Again, I want to take a 60 second. Bear with me for 60 seconds as we go to Thailand and, and see our Thai students in their robes and their plexiglass shields. As we look at a common occurrence in the suburbs of, of Dallas, Georgia, where we see young people social distancing and wearing masks and not being able to engage and talk about the, the, the day's activities. As fast as university students are moving out in some universities because they were not prepared, uh, they are uh, moving in, they're moving out. As we look at open air schools in India, a very important thing to do for COVID-19, and it could be something that we look to in the future. But bottom line, you see individual students not engaging with their teachers and not engaging with fellow students. In Florida, you'll see a graduation that happened this summer. And in that graduation, you'll see that they took very important steps to wear masks and to social distance. But you'll also see something that was uh, uh, natural and human at the end. You saw a large high school that came together when they, said, when they celebrated the graduation, what happened? The mask came off, people came together, and there was a super spreader situation on hand. We need to be very cautious about those type of incidents. We see plexiglass and plexiglass going up more and more and more in schools around us. And that is important, but it's creating something within our society, a plexiglass society uh, that we need to be very cautious of. We neither either need to uh, continue to acknowledge the fact that that is one way to stop the disease, but we also need to, to look at how impersonal our world becomes. We look at Bangkok, Thailand and plexiglass. We look at Barcelona, Spain, with teachers trying to prevent a hug of human beings. That's a sad story, but a reality of the world that we're living in. We see South Africa, where we have social distancing. We have Wuhan, China, where we have more plexiglass. And, then, and as we look at lunchrooms around the world, we see individual students who should be celebrating the fact of joy in the classroom and learning that are isolated, and you can see the looks on their face. We see Frankfurt, Germany, which is a, a very normal occasion where we're, we're disinfecting as we walk into different places. We have Yokohama, Japan, where in a large auditorium we have social distancing, students not engaging with each other. We have a headmistress in, in Russia that is checking temperatures, just like we do in Florida and many schools and school districts as kids get on and off the bus. We have robotic graduations in Tokyo. We have lines of cars of grad graduating students so they can uh, social distance in Puerto Rico. We have a very isolated Illinois graduation. And again, come, keep coming back to the phenomenon of human engagement in Barcelona, Spain, where we tell human beings they can't connect with each other. Again, a reality, reality in the world that we're living in. At the same time, those human connections that are very, very missing, that we as educators need to find ways to pay attention to the, uh, the health issues, but also allow that, that, that human heart to continue to grow and flourish, because that's where learning growth. And again, as we look in the eyes of that young girl in Scotland, it tells us a story about our kids. It tells us a story about education that we can't allow to happen. So as we look at human contact, inter interaction, and engagement, yes, we can learn without it. But we adolescent learning will not happen without it. It will not happen to the extent that we need to. Isaac Stern, the celebrated 
uh, violinist said music is what happens between the notes. As we look at learning, learning can happen by opening a book. Learning can happen through a PowerPoint. Learning can happen through no, through a lecture. At the same time, that deep engagement it w is makes learning real and makes it a part of our hearts and weaves it into the fabric of who we are. That's true learning. We had a, a, a situation in the spring where we had pre-existing relationships that enhanced the probability of the spring 2020 learning success. As we step into this fall, we don't have a lot of those pre-existing relationships. We need to find as educators, how do I touch the hearts of those children? How do I engage with our community? Because we need to develop those relationships because without those relationships, we lose in terms of learning. Our learning community changes and our learning community drifts in different directions. Creating trust doesn't happen in a meeting is a term that very often happens in the business, uh, business and industry. I want to make sure the fact that we can't have meeting upon e meeting, we need to have engagement because what happens between those meetings creates that meaningful uh, uh, understanding of what happened in the meeting. How we perpetuate or create our new learning and growth relationships is the key thing that, as educators that we need to, to establish. How will we perpetuate and create our new learning and growth relationships when we don't know those kids? I go back to that story I told as we opened up. The, uh, the aspiring principal who is a student at Barry University and their principal who had 144 students in their school and they, they made it to 136 doors during the summer because as we talked about this, they took on that challenge. They said, we will perpetuate growth and relationships and we will knock on every single door. And in a school of 144, you can do that. But in a school of 2,400, which I was the principal, we had 230 faculty and staff, and yes, you can do the exact same thing. Yes, in the, in the era of COVID-19, uh, we need to be cautious about those connections. At the same time, we need to find ways to perpetuate that, those relationships and that growth. We also know there is a significant uh, um, knowledge base in social and emotional learning, uh, one of the biggest drivers in education that we have today. And the def definition is the process in which children and adults understand and manage their emotions and leverage that learning. Driving learning outcomes through that social emotional connection is something as educators we cannot allow COVID-19 to inhibit. And we need to find ways to make that happen, be it that we're having, we're having flex learning, we're having in-class learning, if we're having um, online learning, it needs to happen. In our learners, our youth, our, our K-12 uh, learners, it is critical that that happens. As we look at the 2020 Brookings Institute uh, uh, summary of learning, um, as we look at MAP testing and using RIP, RIP scores, you'll find that uh, they, they look at student achievement and they look at normal growth patterns. One of the things that we see both in reading and math, that there is a significant decline. Of course, the RIT, the MAP, the measures of academic progress shows the impact of learning throughout the year and as it continues into the next year. And one of the things that we find is that normal growth pattern has significantly changed. We have seen significant declines and amazing gaps in learning across the spectrum in both reading and math. And can that be okay for two weeks? For, can that be okay for three months? How long can we perpetuate that before it becomes a critical crisis in our country? And I think we all agree that there is learning crisis within our country, and we have silos of greatness, and we have gaps. At the same time, we are going in the wrong direction as learning organizations, and we cannot allow this to continue. So if we look at both reading and we look at math, you'll see those significant those normal growth patterns are no longer there, and you'll see the significant decline in gaps. We cannot allow that and cannot tolerate that, and how will we engage as educators to make sure that doesn't continue to happen? Because as we look at the fall and into the winter, we can anticipate most schools across the country will be engaged in online learning and flex-type learning learning in person and those personal relationships will be inhibited by lots of things. It could be inhibited by mass. It could be inhibited by illness. It could be inhibited by, by plastic in front of us. Also, as we look at history, we know that any time that there has been a significant crisis or trauma, there has been evolving change, significant evolving change. As you look at a crisis and attitude shifts, which has been devastating throughout our country and in terms of significantly changing how we operate, some things very good as we, as we more deeply engage with our families at home. 
crisis and attitude shifts, as we look at 9-11, as we look at how we travel, as you look at World War II and women gaining a voice in the workplace, if you look at SARS and the e-commerce across Asia and into our country, significant changes, significant changes will be left with us because of COVID-19. What will be those significant changes and how will we adapt to them? The one thing we can't do is accept the fact that it happened and allow us to drift by default instead of using our leadership power to make something happen. Crisis and trauma through history has the power to reshape. So as we look at these next three bullets, how can we as learning communities prepare for a post-crisis world rather than hunkering down and waiting for a return to the past? And I put those words there very intentionally. As I talk to hundreds of teachers, one of the things that came to me uh, in, in, October, or, sorry, in March very clearly was, we need to take a deep breath. This all shall, shall pass. It didn't. We got into the spring, and it didn't. You got into states like Michigan that just said, we are done learning. As we get into the fall, we have a similar situation. Will it return by the holidays? Right now we have a government that says there will be a, uh, uh, a, a medical improvements by the holidays and something will significantly change. We have epidemiologists that says even if we do, we will have another 18 months of extreme challenges. So as we look at learning communities preparing for a pro 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 post-crisis world, rather than hunkering down and waiting for a return to the past, what will we do? What will you do? How will you impact change? We must distinguish between temporary postponed and a new normal hybrid. We had temporary in, in March. We had some postponements. And now we have a new normal. We have a new normal, and how long will it last? Will, will it last through September? Most people are betting it goes into the winter. Epidemiologists are telling us very clearly that we have 18 more months before things start to clear and we have a normal 10% uh, or lower infection rate. How will we provide leadership to design our future or will we be satisfied with the default drift? I won't be satisfied with the default drift. Our children, our country, our communities are way too important. Most leaders across the country are not leading, they're managing and they're waiting for something to happen. So how will we provide leadership to design our future? Again, not to abandon those quality traditions that we have, but design our future for the next month, for the next six months, the next 18 months for the future because our world will be different because of COVID-19 as historically we have seen just as World War II was other pandemics. It brings me back to a very common quote, God, get, God, grant, God grant me this remedy to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. How do I determine the things that I can control as a leader? I can't control our government's response. I can't control the financial crisis that we're in. But there are things that I can control as a leader, as a parent, as a teacher, as a principal, as a community member. We need to look at what can we control, and we need to control that. We need to engage. We can't wait for other people. We, as leaders, need to actionize the process. Which brings us back to our why, our mission, vision, and values. We need to explore our mission, vision, and values. We need to have a vision for the future. Is it the same vision we had before, today, and tomorrow? Are our values the same? I, I, I believe they probably are. Our mission as educators is the same. So how will we engage as leaders to really evaluate and look into ourselves and into our community to take our mission, vision, and values, to look at our current situation and what we project will happen in the next two months, 10 months, 18 months, and make sure that we're driving a new normal. We're not allowing the default drift to happen. So as we focus and create impact and support our outcomes, we need to look at different things. How do we reallocate um, resources? I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, happened to be in Minnesota, um, as the riots happened and the call for defunding the police. As I sat down with a police officer and a community member, one of the things that hit me very loudly is we, they weren't talking about not having a strong law enforcement and not being supportive of law enforcement, but looking at how we reallocate dollars. As educators, as we look at how we reallocate dollars, do we need to relook at the age of COVID-19? We are always short of dollars, but how do we look at the processes and systems that we have 
and are this, those, those same allocation of resources um, proper now as they, they were last year? How do we prioritize or reprioritize programming? We need to find in ways to engage with kids, period. We need to find that, and I can't highlight that enough. How do we engage in our communities? If we re redesign schools today, would we create what we have today? A year ago, I would have also said no. Yes, there are great things about our schools. There are wonderful traditions that we have, but there also are systemic issues. We have an opportunity in this crisis to really look at what do we want to have as we come out of it. Re imaging schools post-COVID, how will the pandemic change schools? And then we look, need to look at re-engineering because grand visions and dreams won't make it happen, but re-engineering and action process and policy will. As we look at Paul Renville, who is a scholar at Harvard University and he was a former Secretary of Education in Massachusetts, he said something that aligns with this. In this situation, we don't simply want to frantically struggle to restore the status quo because the status quo wasn't operating at an effective level and certainly wasn't serving all of our children well. It was serving our children, but it wasn't serving all of our children well. So again, how do we leverage this time and begin in systemic changes to when we step out of this, we are in a better place? Evolution and revolution. What things do we need to protect? What do, things do we need to slowly change? And what things do we need to have a revolution to change? Will we purposely conserve traditions or continue systemic issues? I think that's a very, very important mantra that we need to continue to ask us our questions. Purposely conserve traditions or continue systematic, systemic issues? We, or do we need to reimage and re-engineer education? And that's a big, big thought, especially when you have kids in front of you every day and we're in, in, in the return to school. At the same time, I go back to that mentioned before, who is your chief visionary? If you're not doing it, who is doing it? Because it has to be done. The school that I was a principal and engaged with for 23 years had some very, very strong um, guiding principles. And every year, almost every four years, we sat down with our kids in our community, a, a school of about 2,400 students, so 330,000 square feet, 150,000 community members in the area. Guiding principles, how will we actionize that in the era of COVID and beyond. What that school is doing today is looking at their guiding principles. They're looking at those critical guiding principles that have always been there, uh, even 23 years ago, with respect, trust, integrity, and honesty. You'll also see engaged learning, uh, engaged learners, uh, building meaningful relationships, passion, lifelong learning, uh, embracing challenges, all those things that are critically important. And one of the things that learning organization is doing as we speak is looking at COVID-19 March through summer, looking at returning to school, and how do those guiding principles that have served us so very, very well for a number of years, will they continue? Or how do we change our practice policy um, and actionize that, re-engineer our current practices to make sure we are still living those guiding principles? And that's critical for every organization to do. As we look at this statement, can our schools be so welcoming, so inviting, and so comfortable that every person who walks through our doors believes they are about to have an amazing experience? This was the center of ECU High School, again, where I was the principal. As we look at that first statement, it is a powerful, powerful statement, but those kids are not walking through those doors. We want them to be welcomed. We want it to be inviting. We want it to be comfortable. At the same time, we want to give them those amazing emotion-filled experiences, amazing experiences. But how will we do that today as opposed to how we did it in the past? Thus, that, that uh, burning question, do I belong, is one of the biggest concerns that students have in almost every grade level. Let's give students proof every day that this is the right class and the right teacher. Do I belong? As I sit in a passive crockpot classroom, do I belong is difficult. As a teacher, how do I engage with those students and give them that emotionally filled uh, uh, situation when I can't physically touch their shoulder, shake their hand, hear about their day? We need to find ways to do that. If not, this is no longer truth. We need to have truth that needs to be authentic or we need to change. Again, we don't need to abandon ship. At the same time, how do we take these principles, our guiding principles, and make them real and authentic to drive our practice? This is also a school that prides themselves on the first day of school and, and term transitions to make sure that 230 faculty and staff are out gui uh, 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 guiding and engaging with 2,400 students. 
this year that can't be done in the in in the era of covid we can't those high fives possibly could happen those hugs aren't going to happen and they measured their success by smiles in the hallways and in large events we took pictures and we videoed and we analyzed that emotion we wanted that joy for learning that joy for engagement to be ever present because that's when learning happens so as you look at those pictures those aren't going to happen when that when school returns uh, hopefully that will happen someday. So how do we make those realities um, happen in the era of COVID-19? As we look at Barry University, Barry University prides themselves on their core commitments and they live it and they weave it into the fabric of who they are. Knowledge and truth, uh, how they emphasize lifelong learning, how they promote the common good in the more humane uh, and just society. Um, and I want to really underline the humane, that humanness, um, uh, the passion, the heartfelt goodness that, that, that comes with people, and how do, we, how do we bring that into our society and our community. Inclusive community from the other side of a computer, how do we allow that to happen, or do we find ways? We do need to find ways, or we can't have that as part of our core commitments. And I know at Barry University, we're not going to take away that inclusive community, and we're going to talk about a few ways that we continue to do that. Social justice, one of the most important things in our society today as we look at bringing social justice to life, not just the beautiful words of it, not just the, the religious um, connotations of it. We want to make sure that we in, in, embed it in everything that we do and, again, weave it into the fabric of who we are. And collaborative service, how do we reach out? As we look at our social work interns, as we look at our psychology interns, our, our teacher interns, not being able to engage in a community and a collab get into collaborative service, that's a challenge. But we need to find an answer to it. As we look at Barry University, last spring, as things came to a close in March, we said we were going to continue online. And one of the things that came up is, yes, uh, we are talented enough faculty. We will have quality learning. We will do what we need to do to get to the finish line, but it won't be good enough. We need to find a way to make sure that we leverage all of those assets that we have to make sure that we bring those core commitments to life. And so the, the wisdom and leadership um, not in action, uh, the president and provost and, and many other of the administrative leaders along with the faculty and staff at Barry University came together and says we can do better. But it does take boots on the ground. It does take human beings to do this. And they put together a process. Uh, it started with a dream. It started with a vision. And as we look at flexible learning at Barry University, it isn't where we necessarily intend to be forever, but we will find best practice. We will leverage those best practice. We will leverage some of our common traditions. But flexible learning will boldly transform our campus in a human, I want to underline, human learning experience through the use of dynamic interactive technology aligned with the Barry University core commitments. That is a commitment, a vision statement that will drive Barry University. And again, Again, this isn't about Barry University today. I want you to reflect on your learning organization. Driven by our learning teams and faculty leaders to provide learning momentum, responsive instruction, personal communication, and technical support. Driven by learning teams, teams of passionate educators that are leaders within the organization, provide learning momentum, energy, passion, not just a crockpot of delivered education, Responsive instruction means that it's a two-way street and personal communication. How do we engage with students to make sure that they know they are valued and this is a special place for them? Because that's when learning happens. And the outcome, health, safety, and well-being of our students, faculty, and staff. We know that our teachers need to feel comfortable. They need to feel capable. They need to feel supported. Our students need to feel safe when they come back on campus while enhancing the student's experience. Again. We are going to enhance the student's experience. We are not going to let COVID-19 limit our experience. We, our intention is to enhance the student experience, our retention of students, and promoting future enrollment. That's a business discussion, but if our students aren't learning, if our students don't feel well cared for, if our students don't have an emotionally positive learning experience, it will have devastating effects on the organization at Barry University, in your school, and also in your community. We also need to look at actionizing as data measures, measured systems thinking. That vision that I just wrote, read to you, vision without systems thinking, ends up painting lovely pictures of the future with no deep understanding of the forces that must be mastered to move us from here to there. We talked about the force field analysis earlier. 
our vision will only take us where we plan, where we systematically put process, policy, and practice in place. We weave it into our fa the fabric of who we are through our habits every single day. And so again, it starts with a vision. Who is your chief visionary in your classroom, in your family, in your community, in your learning organization? Because we need to start with a vision. We need to have our mission, vision, and values. We need to have uh, systems that we measure and drive where we go. Leadership is the key. We know from these two statements, the research tells us very strongly, leadership is second only to the classroom instruction. Classroom instruction being the teacher leader. Leadership is only second to classroom instruction among all school-related factors that contribute to what student learns. The key is leadership, principal leadership and learning leadership by teachers in the classroom and how we collaborate and how we hold hands together. The next one, principals are multipliers of effective teaching. Great teachers that make it happen. Principals create, principals and leaders create opportunities for teachers to, to be successful. And we can only do that if we collaborate and we empower teachers to come together and do that. Teaching and learning in COVID-19. At the end of this presentation, there are many, many, many resources as we look at what we can do within our communities. But we need to decide as individuals, as you reflect as a leader, what will be that one, two, three, or four things that you commit to to make sure that COVID-19 doesn't inhibit the growth of your organization, but enhances the probability that learning takes place. Expanding our base of leadership and influence means that the principal or the president isn't driving the trunk. The president of the United States or the governor isn't driving the trunk. But we as individual leaders, as community members, as parents, as teachers, as assistant principals, principals, as faculty members, um, all are engaged in a leadership influence. Expanding our base of leadership influence. At Barry University, uh, Dr. Allen knew that he could not turn this around by himself, so he ignited a momentum, a huge web of faculty members, boots on the ground, to look at flexible learning. We wanted to look at a passionate vision. We wanted to look at practical application and engagement to make sure that we expand our base of leadership. We started with professional learning communities. We expanded those learning communities and learning circles. We will continue to do that to make sure that we enhance the probability and we have an exponential growth in those boots on the ground uh, and our base of leadership. Again, one person can't do it. Empowerment is aligned with our guiding principles, our mission, vision, and values. We need to, as ECU High School did, as I mentioned before, when you saw those puzzle pieces, really dig into our guiding principles, our core commitments, our mission, vision, values to decide, are we hitting those targets? And if we aren't, what are those key components that we need to focus on? We need to create a plan. Humanizing learning and learning communities, one of the biggest areas of research in the last six months has really looked at humanizing learning because it became dehumanized. It became, there wasn't that emotional connection to drive individuals. And uh, some of the, the, the core con concepts that come from that research is that show that you create, that you care and authentically and personally engage. Show that you care authentically that you care. How do we authentically show that we care? We need to find that out because that's when we enhance the probability that learning takes place. Communicate and connect with your community. Over communicate. Again, I'll go back to that aspiring principal and the, uh, the principal from that small elementary school in Miami-Dade. They went house to house and talked to every individual and told them what school would be like. They told them that they cared and made sure that they felt valued and important. Create a culture that's grounded in trust not just words coming from a politician. We are all used to hearing words coming from our political leaders in this, the, our society lately. And do we trust that things will happen? We need to create trust. Reflect on purpose and values. Redesign our culture. We need to decide, is this culture serving us well? Is our community serving us well? And how do we re-engineer? Or how do we recommit to those co common core traditions that are very important. Cultures evolve and can be gained or lost and it cannot be measured in, in, ter in definitive terms. Culture evolves. And where is your culture going? Where is your learning culture going? Where is your personal culture going? Or is there a drift? Culture within a virtual environment is the exact same thing. Purpose and culture need to go hand in hand. We need to have trust. We need to have engaging. We need to nurture cultures to make it go the direction that we would like it to go. We need to sustain. We need to water, water the fields to make the crops grow. As we look at learning behaviors, we need to look at the behaviors of our leaders. 
is it very evident and present in all of our leaders, in all of our teachers, um, embedded in the, in the network of organizational practices? Um, as we talked before, we can't do this by just vision. We need to have practices that help us do this. So you need to evaluate, is the vision for your organization, for your classroom, for your community, for your family, supported by processes that make it happen. Shared beliefs, values, and assumptions by all the members of the organization, visible in the way that we do things every single day. If I log in every single day and say, welcome to class, read the content, take the test, that is not a visible way to make people show that they're valued and engage in that personal, passionate learning process. Evident in the behaviors and individuals of the group. How do our students behave? How do our communities behave? Is our organizational culture? We need to be very, very cautious that we know and understand our culture, that we support our culture, that we grow our and fertilize our culture and develop it in the direction that we want it to go, or the opposite will happen. And it's not easy. I know it's not easy. And comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. We need to be uncomfortable right now. We need to engage in the work to make sure that things happen. We need to have the discourse, that uncomfortable discussion and debate. Uh, I'm involved in discussions and debates every single day that create my, make my heart race and my adrenaline flow. But we need to listen. We need to debate. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be reflective as leaders. And then we need to diverge and discuss, and we need to converge and make something happen as we look to the future. Inaction will, allow, will not allow us to move forward, but we will continue to drift. Growth mindset and fixed mindset. I think we all as educators know in a growth mindset that we believe that things can get better, that we do have the ability to grow and develop, as opposed to fixed mindset is I'm either dumb or I'm smart. Uh, that's not the case. Toxic mindset is one of the biggest areas of, of debate and discussion and research in our organizational cultures today. Because as we look at what we have experienced from March, late spring, summer, and into the fall, we put pressure on ourselves because we don't know what's going to happen. Our leaders have not let us know for good reasons and for, uh, for reasons that, that uh, don't support rationale. We worry too much. We over-engage in gossip and negativity. And that creates something in our culture. And we have developed in many, many cultures a toxic mindset because of the confusion and the chaos, um, the, the trauma that COVID has caused. Be closer to school year as rituals. We don't have those closure rituals. The, you saw pictures of the end of the school year where we have those wonderful experiences where we celebrate the outcomes. We, we, uh, we uh, encourage people and we pat people on the back. We weren't able to do that. Uh, we have a summer of isolation and uncertainty. Uh, continuing into the fall, plan set and abandon. Oh my, that's where a toxic mindset comes. We need to be able to engage with our learning communities like we never have before. We need to make sure that, yes, we have pressure to do things, but we also have support. With pressure and support, we have quality, um, uh, peace of mind. Uh, we can't worry about it too much. We just have to behave. We have to move forward. Uh, engagement in gossip and negativity. Yes, there's enough gossip and negativity out there in our community, both politically, nationally, and as we begin to move forward. As we, again, as we have a governor that says we're going back to school, we have a teacher's union that uh, puts in a lawsuit. We have the World Health Organization that says wear masks and not wear masks. Yes, it creates a toxic mindset that we need to be very aware of, and we need to make sure we flush from our organizations. Driven by research and authentic application, our learning management systems, how do we leverage our learning management systems? They can be toxic, impersonal crockpots or they can come alive if we use the tools. If we use the tools of the video process, as we use the tools of our rubrics, if we use the tools of the assessment processes, we can enhance the probability of our best practice through this, this application. Yes, it is not the best way, it is not the only way, but we need to leverage our learning management systems as much as we can. As we take those learning management systems, how do we personalize? through video, through our computers, through making sure that, that we have the competencies to engage at a more personal level uh, to, again, leverage all of those wonderful tools that we have. It isn't the defi definitive answer, but it is something that enhances the probability of quality learning. So the how. How do we look at this? 
and it will be up to you to reflect on your practice, in your role as a leader, in your learning community. Relationships are the key. How do we enhance the probability of learning through powerful emotional relationships? We know in any quality organization it is developed on those relationships, those leadership relationships, and that 51% responsibility that we take responsibility for what is happening in our learning and our learning community. And our biggest challenge is battling with each other because we're taking responsibility for that. Empowerment and collaboration. We need to trust our teachers. We need to trust our community members. We need to empower and collaborate. We can't do it alone. When Dr. Allen came out and said, we are going to have a transformative experience, this spring will not continue. We will enhance the probability of learning through a number of different areas. He empowered our organization. He engaged deeply with the organization to become more personalized and humanized. That created momentum to, for us to focus and drive, be driven by our purpose, for us to look back at our collective commitments and make sure that we're driving that even though we are inhibited by some of our learning challenges. We need to actionize in policy, practice, and habits. How do we really look at everything we do as a teacher, as a family member, as a community member, to make sure that our practices and habits are woven in the fabric of who we are and who we really want to be, again, driven by our authentic, heartfelt mission, vision, and values. Learning is not binary. Traditional or online isn't a, a, a one or the other. We need to leverage best practice. We need to take flexible learning. We need to take those things that we know through experienced educators are powerful in the classroom. We need to take some of the digital operations. We need to flip classrooms. We need to use video. We need to visit communities. We need to engage with people. We need to leverage and make sure that if we're driven by research-based best practice, authentic application, and we can enhance learning through technology, we know that, but we also need to bring that human dynamic involved. We also need to be relentless and resilient, and we all become very, very tired when we think about that, but as leaders, we can't be satisfied with inaction. We need action to make sure that our kids have the learning experience that they have. And as we begin to conclude, again, I come back to relationships are, are at the heart of a school, and those between principal and coach, those principal and coach, meaning a leader, and his or her teachers, followers, are among the most dynamic nuances and the potentially the most rewarding for our students and our community in general. So basically saying our relationships are, are at the heart of our community and how do we leverage relationships in the era of COVID-19 to make sure that we are enhancing the probability of learning. School cultures that are mature enough to embrace the process of empowerment. Um, we can't control everything. We should control everything. We need to have developed our organizations, and if we haven't, we need to we need to back up and get a redo. We need to have school cultures, community cultures, family cultures, spiritual cultures that we are mature enough to embrace the process of empowerment to make sure that we drive um, all of those factors with the greatest numbers of leaders that we possibly can. I want to invite you to be the difference. I want to invite you to dream as we did tonight. I want to invite your voice. Your voice needs to be ever present at the table. People need to share their voice. People need to listen. We need to have that discourse because change is upon us. We need to actionize our leadership, and I wish you the very, very best as we do that. The last thing that I'd like to do today as we go back to the initial discussion that we had originally, that leadership reflection, the 51% responsibility rule, where our biggest challenge is, is it in action? It isn't default drift. It is a group of learning leaders, community leaders, that are driving a process that are engaging so deeply, so passionately, and so emotionally and personally that great things will happen through that discourse. We will continue to diverge, our dreams will be realized, and we'll put together something to either support our traditions or re-engineer the process. And we'll look at our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities and threats, and that's where the reflection from today comes in. I will encourage you and invite you to continue, not stop this conversation, but continue to reflect and engage in your community about those powerful strengths that, that you will not let go 
that you need to continue to, uh, to passionately support within your community, or we need to debate the systemic challenges that we need to abandon, that that tradition is something that isn't good for our, our organization. What are those weaknesses? What opportunities do we see as we look at, again, I'll go back to your chief vision operator um, within your organization. Um, who will provide leadership. And we also look at the threats. We know some of the threats are inactivity, um, our inability to engage with people. Those are threats, and how do we neutralize those threats? We also look at our force field analysis, and we know this tells me very strongly in the center where it says proposed change will be a new reality. We know that March happened, something changed within our organization. The rest of the spring happened. We continued to go in a direction, some of it by design and some of it by de default. We had our normal uh, drift through the summer, and we started school again. We have forces for change, and we have forces resisting change. And bottom line, something will happen. Something will happen at the end of September, October, and into the fall. Our learning organizations, our children will be impacted either by our action or is our inaction. And through a SWOT analysis and uh, through a force field analysis, that can be a tool that we as leaders come together and begin to drive. I mentioned earlier that ECU High School and those puzzle pieces are, are deeply involved in this process. And I know other schools are. Barry University is, and I know that your schools are. And if your schools are not, um, I would strongly encourage you and invite you to step up to the leadership table to make sure that you're doing three things. You're looking at where do we purposefully hold on to those traditions that are very important to us as educators? How do we look at who we need to be and where we will be going? What are our dreams and how do we make them a reality? So I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, and uh, I will stop the recording in just a moment so we can move it on to uh, other entities and other opportunities. And I will stop that recording and allow either for you to move on for uh, the rest of your day or from, uh, for a bit of uh, discussion, question and answer, and other opportunities. At the end of this slide, if you uh, email me, I will be happy to send you a copy of that. It will also be posted in online in several areas. There are also additional resources that are wonderful web resources to look at research-based and best practice in the era, uh, era of COVID-19 to help support your leadership. Again, I want to thank you for both your attendance and your leadership and wish you the very, very best. Thank you for your attendance. I will now stop the recording and allow you to move on to other things, or we can engage in a short discussion. Thank you for being here tonight.